God is good. If you have your Bible with you today, go ahead and get it out. And got your Bible apps? Go ahead and get your Bible apps fired up. And I, I want to encourage you to find two places. The first one is 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4. And, and then Romans 12. 1 Peter 4, Romans 12. If you're new with us, or if you're new to church like completely and say, I don't even know what a Romans or a Peter is <laughs> or are, uh, then uh, listen the best you can. You're fine. We were all where you are. We used to be where you are at some point and, and uh, good things will happen. Okay. I, I started a series a couple weeks ago called Gifted. I want to continue along these lines today. Gifted. Anybody here gifted? Do we have any gifted people? Well, I can show you a verse. You are correct. 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So according to that verse, you are gifted. Yeah. Well, what does a good steward do though? They use the gift. It's one thing to be, to be gifted or say or acknowledge, I'm gifted. It's a whole other thing to actually use it. And there are a whole lot of gifted people doing nothing, right? Good stewardship has to do with I acknowledge, I readily recognize that there is something of God in my life. It came by his grace. I didn't earn it or work it up. It was just given to me. And they're looking for an opportunity to use it. In other words, if, if you're a hammer, look for nails, <laughs> Yeah, that would be the best use of your existence as a hammer. Look for nails. If you're a teacher, look for a learner. Hmm? You know, if you're a, if you're a servant, look for a need. But we have, to, we have to put ourselves out there, not sit back and, and wait for someone to ask. Right. Well, if there's a need, if someone comes to me, then I'll use my hammer on their nail. Uh, no, if you recognize that you have a gift from God, you look for opportunities to use it. Yeah. That's how this works. Because before you know it, you're out of here. Before you know it, we're all done with this life. And we're going to stand before the Lord and say, you know, if they would have just asked me, if someone would have come to me, if someone would have given me an opportunity, I certainly would have used this. But that's not the question anymore. It's actually, what did we do with what we have been given? Yeah. Amen. Because how many know we're not forced to do anything? Holy Spirit is not a forcer. The devil's a forcer. He's a pusher. He's an intimidator. Driven, but drives people by fear. The Spirit of God, he will lead you gently. He will guide you. He will speak to you. And often his voice is not booming. Can be, but often his voice is much more subtle. And more quiet. He will lead us into the right place. We know salvation is not preceded by doing anything for God. It's not conditioned upon it. However, the saved life does have gift usage built into it. In other words, if I were to describe a person who has a relationship with God has received eternal life, I wouldn't say, yeah, they receive a gift and they do nothing. They receive salvation and then they do nothing lest they slip into the works category. No, once received, we begin to act on the very gifts of God inside of us. That's normal. That's, that's the way God wants it to be. If it ever seems, if you ever had the thought, well, to do something or to work or to use my abilities for God and for his kingdom, that would be hard. Or that sounds tiresome. I'm already busy. I've already, you know, maxed out with my schedule and, my, and everything. It would seem hard to do that. Uh, th that's a wrong thought, okay? Imagine this. God gifts you and you do nothing with it. Can I tell you what, what a good descriptor of that life is? Hard. If you think it's hard to do something with it, try not doing something with it. That's a difficult life. That's a challenging way to live. When you're in your place, God's grace enables you to be your best. His grace enables you to function at your highest level. It's a hard and burdensome thing to do your own will. 
You remember when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, my yoke is easy and my burden is, is light. When you are yoked up with the Lord, you're connected with him. You're walking with him and fulfilling his plan for your life. There is an ease to your life as well. There is a breeze in your back. There, there, there is something that, that helps you to do it. When, when I'm ignoring the gifts of God inside of me, it's like I'm walking into the wind. It's like uh, I like to fly sometimes. Some of you know that. In a small airplane. Um, the, well, all airplanes, but small. You know, I only know the small ones. Uh, the wind can make a huge difference. And, you know, it's amazing what can happen. But you could, be, you could be flying over a freeway, you know, or interstate, speed limit's 80. And if you've got a nice good headwind, the cars will pass you. <laughs> That's not even right, is it? <laughs> you are a car. I am an airplane. I go faster than you. <laughs> and if you're on a straight road, you've got a headwind, you could be going fast through the air, but your ground speed could be really slow. Yeah, and uh, and in the same way as the opposite, you can your plane can go way faster if you get a tailwind, way faster than it's capable of producing with its own engine. Yeah, and and in our lives, if we are doing the will of God, we're going the right direction. We have help. It's hard to go the wrong way. It's easy to go the right way. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. If someone said, well, my life is hard. Well, that's scriptural. You know, Proverbs 13, 15 says, but the way of the transgressor is hard. Yeah. Somebody say, ouch. <laughs> and this is the way we need to think of it. If I'm doing the will of God, if I'm in the right place, I have grace to do it. I have strength. I have help. I have a breeze behind my back. If I'm doing the wrong thing or doing nothing with what's in me, I'm, I'm, I got a headwind. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard for me to do, for me to be everything God wants me to be. Everybody okay? Amen. Um, amen. And so take a load off. What do you mean take a load off? Stop carrying so much. Stop. So you mean I'm doing too much? If we're doing the wrong thing, we're doing too much. It's kind of like the, princi the principles. You see this all throughout Scripture. Let me just throw this out at you as a, for instance. Do you think a person can get more done working seven days a week or working six days a week? Come on, do the math. <laughs> Got your extra eight hours or whatever. Can you do more with an extra eight hours in a week or less? Now, you punch it up on the calculator, work all seven. That makes sense. Right? You run that through the filter of God's wisdom, and he says, no, if you'll do six and take the one off, you'll get a lot more done. You will be far more successful and fruitful and productive in your life. And it's the way we, we were created. It doesn't punch up on the calculator, but in real life, it totally works. Is it, can I live better off 90% of my income or 100%? Here's the truth. Now you punch it up on the calculator. Oh no, no, I need that extra 10%. That can pay this, that can buy this. In reality, no, that is not how life works. Some of you who don't, who don't bother honoring the Lord was the first of your tithe, you recognize that, huh? Yeah, it's tight. And you think, I don't know if I could do that. Work seven days then. Spend all your money. Don't use your gifts. Fly into the wind all day long. I mean, we'll, we'll be out of here in a minute anyway, but you're 70, 80, 90, 100, 120 years on earth. This is going to be hard. This is going to be difficult. But when we by faith say, I'm going to do things the Lord's way. I don't know about the math here. It doesn't really totally calculate. But if I'll trust him and do it his way, Finances are blessed. My time is blessed. My life has his blessings on it because I'm using what is in me. I'm being a faithful steward of the grace or gift of God on the inside. Everybody okay today? 
Romans chapter 12, if you would. Let's take a look. Romans chapter 12. How many are thankful for pizza and <laughs> pasta? All the good things the Romans brought. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. Uh, it, it reads here, For I say through the grace given to me. Now let's slow down just for a moment. Moment. When, it, when the Bible reads here, for I say, who's I? I is a guy named Paul, right? Paul was gifted, called, anointed by God to be an apostle and a teacher as well. But he, he is gifted by God and an apostle is a sent one. He, 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 he said, I say this, but it's not just some dude named Paul. No offense to anyone named Paul. <laughs> but he's not just my neighbor Paul. He's Paul... Uh, who's got something from God working through him to do this. It's not just his idea. Ideas are a dime a dozen. We can all tell people what we think and may be good, might not be good. Paul says here, I say, I say this through the grace given to me. This is not just my idea. This is not just a natural human being trying to give some wise counsel to the, the Christians in Rome. He said, I'm saying this through the grace of God. In other words, there is a gift of God in me to tell you certain things, to communicate certain truths. Yeah? How many know, if I just bring you an idea, I'm just Joe Blow and I have an idea and I have a thought, you can take it or leave it. But if I, through the grace of God in me, say something, that's when the wise person will recognize that's God there. There's something about that that comes from heaven. Yeah, and that's what he's telling them. I'm saying this through the grace of God in me. In other words, he's building up his case a little bit. He's saying, listen, pay attention to, to this because God called me to say this to you. He said, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Okay, so, so notice the language. Paul said, I want you basically to think about yourself. Do you ever think about yourself? <laughs> yeah, that's my problem. Too much. Uh, yeah. But that's not scriptural to think about yourself. But he said, I don't want you to think about yourself this way. Don't think of yourself too highly. I want you to think of yourself soberly. Think of yourself. Analyze yourself. How else am I going to know if I'm a hammer or I'm a saw? I'm a screwdriver. How do I know what I am? How do I know what's in me? I need to think about myself. So that's not wrong. That's right. But he said, think clearly. Think soberly. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So what should I do when I view my own life? At least in part, I should see God's faith in me. Everybody say it out loud. Say, I know that God has dealt a measure of faith to me. Yeah, don't, don't ever say, I don't have any faith. Well, yes, you do. You have a measure at least. God put it in you. He put inside of each and every one of us this measure of faith. I want to see myself, not just my skin, my skin color, my hair, my clothes, my personality, my past, my failings, my victories. I don't want to just see that. I want to see the gift of God in myself. Not only that, I want to go beyond it. I want to see the gift of God in you. I want to see you not just by your outward characteristics, right? I want to see you by the gift of God. And if I could see that in you, if you could see that in me, we can go somewhere. It is when people only view others from the outside that we limit the work of God. Jesus himself went to his hometown of Nazareth, 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 Nazareth. Lazarus, Nazareth, okay, uh, <laughs> Nazareth one day, and Jesus, the miracle worker, the authoritative teacher, he was speaking the word of God, and he went home to all the people who knew him. Remember that story? They all looked at him and said, we know who you are. We know your family. We know your brother. You grew up here, and what in the world? Who are you? They were offended at him. They thought, how in the world are you going to do anything special? And because they thought that way, he could do no mighty work there. Their unbelief dominated even the gift and anointing in Jesus himself. 
and they shut him down. He would go everywhere else and kaboom, miracles and signs and wonders. And he shows up at home where everyone knows him from the outside and he couldn't do anything. You see what, what the potential or drawback is in our relationships? It's one reason I love at times to bring in guest speakers because so nobody knows them. I mean, you don't know them personally. You haven't had lunch with them. You haven't seen their dirty socks. <laughs> right? You know, you haven't seen them from the outside. You just hear the testimonies. And you see the pictures. And what happens? You think, oh, that's a person. That's a man of God right there. When they speak, when, if they can pray for me, I'm going to get healed. And because there's a mystique about them, because there's a great respect, the gifts flow easier. But I tell you, we can have this in our midst. We can have this amongst ourselves where we see God in each other and we value and appreciate not just the outward side, but the inward gifting of people. And if we could raise our consciousness of our own lives and see, I can do this. This is a gift of God. You can do something. You can do something. You've got a gift of God in you. Think about it. The Lord is unlimited in his workings. Amen. Amen. I mean, it'd be hard for someone to walk in here with a need without them leaving with it met. Because someone would find out by the Spirit. Someone would communicate. Someone would pray. Someone would operate in their gifting. And lives would be changed so much more. Amen. And so God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members... Do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us, what's the word there? Use them. Different gifts, different people. What should we do? Use them. Use the gifts. That seems simple, but they're often unused. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, I want you to notice all these gifts of God are to be used in proportion to our faith. We've been given a deposit and each one of them is to, use, to be used in proportion to our faith. But how many know faith does grow or in, it can be increased? I know this, the gifts of God in me are much, they function on a much higher level than they did many years ago. Why? My faith has increased. Faith to use and to be used by God in different ways. I can do it at a much higher level because I have a great confidence in me. And just like you use any gift of God in you, you use it and use it and use it and use it. You become proficient. You become confident. You become fearless. You know, I can pull out this hammer. I can hit any nail in. Give me a nail. Someone said, well, this one's a hard nail. I know, but I'm a proficient hammer user. <laughs> So you believe, you can tackle it. And so the more we yield to these things, our faith to use those gifts increases and grows until it's second nature. All right? Uh, uh, but, but these, um, let's see, we're given a measure. But we're supposed to develop it. We're supposed to increase it. And notice something else about this. This faith is not saving faith. He's not talking about he's put inside of you uh, the ability to be saved. Um, in other words, faith to be saved. And that's simply because faith to be saved comes by hearing the gospel. It's not like you just automatically are born with it and dun da da I can be saved. You can't be saved unless you hear about the Savior. Faith comes by hearing. This is not faith to be healed or faith to have a prayer answered. And God's given, given me a measure. Because then the idea is, well, did God give you a, a certain amount of faith for your prayers to be answered, and God gave you more faith for your prayers to be answered. He's talking here about faith for your function. There's a deposit of God in each of us. It's an ability to believe that we can be used by him for his eternal purposes. We can use the gifts of God in us. We all have this faith, so basically we can step out at any time and begin to use them. Good, 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 good. I want you to notice the language used here. In, in Romans 12, it says that God has given us these gifts. 
Now, usually when you, when you, see, when you see the word God in Scripture, G-O-D, uh, it often refers to God the Father. It could refer to, like in Genesis chapter 1, it could refer to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Father, Word, and Holy Spirit. Um, uh, but often, it, when it, it can be specifically referencing God the Father. Everybody with me? The reason I draw that distinction is because in Romans 12, the Father gives, gives these gifts. But there are other passages in here that tell us that the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. And there's another passage that tells us that Jesus gives gifts. Okay? For example, Romans chapter 12, you know, uh, there's nine gifts lift, listed in the first part of that, that chapter. And in, uh, did I say Romans? I, I, I said Romans. I said that in tongues, though. The... <laughs> <laughs> Here's the interpretation. First Corinthians. <laughs> it's always a way to cover. First uh, uh, Corinthians 12 and verse 11. Notice this on the screen. It reads, but the one and same spirit works all these things, distributing each to each one individually as he wills. All right. In other words, the Holy Spirit is delivering, distributing Gifts as he wills. Those are called, we, that's why we refer to those as gifts of the Spirit. Okay, then you go over to Ephesians 4 and you read another passage and this concerns the Son. Look, look, look at this one. It says, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of what? Christ's gift. Christ's gift. And he gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Amen. So we have spirit gifts, we have son gifts, we have father gifts. These gifts here that, we, that, we, that we're looking at in Romans chapter 12 are unique. And, and here's one way I, I think they're unique is because it, it seems like these gifts work in everybody. Not, I, don't, I don't mean all of them work in everybody equally. I mean, these gifts work in everybody, those who are saved and those who are not saved. All right, hold, hold that thought for a minute. If we are all trying to be the same and do the same, many of us are going to miss God. If I look at you and try to be you and you look at me and try to be me, one of us is going to be doing the wrong thing. One of us is going to be missing God. Uh, hammers can't do what screwdrivers do and so forth, even though screwdrivers can do what hammers do. <laughs> I know that from personal experience. It just takes a long time. And I don't want your life and your job and your finances and the church and the kingdom of God to be having a bunch of screwdrivers doing hammer jobs. Why? Because we're going to work twice as hard, half the results, and probably have bloodied uh, hands from missing. You know, we're hitting the... Right? Uh, uh, but these gifts, like I said... Uh, in other words, don't feel pressure. Don't let anyone pressure you to be like someone else. Don't pressure other people to be like you. When I say pressure them, almost stand in judgment because they can't do what you can do. Well, I don't know why I can't do this. This is easy. Everyone can do this. Um, no, everyone can't do that. You have something unique from God in you that enables you to do that. Amen. And so, uh, and so we, wanna, we don't want to fall into, in, into that trap. But these gifts... Like I said, come from the Father. They seem to be operative to some degree in all people. In other words, there are many, many people in the world today that don't have a relationship with God. They have not received eternal life. And yet they have skills. They are good at what they do. They have, uh, you can see them manifesting in business and entertainment and in different, different parts of society. And you think, you are just really good at that. You are gifted at that. Why is that? Because they were born yeah, because they were born and there is part of God, the creator in them, even if they haven't received salvation yet. Yeah. And, and what I, this is one of the things I notice about, uh, about all these gifts is that you can see them manifesting in people even before they come to, to salvation. Nevertheless, once a person gets saved, the goal should be to use what we can do at least to some degree for the kingdom. Let me say it this way. First and foremost to the kingdom. I know our gifts are also tied to our jobs, our gifts. And that's a God thing, by the way. Our, uh, in other words, our, our, 
our professions, our, vo- our vocations, and so forth, uh, for the Christian, they're not secular. It's not like if I'm a Christian and I'm working construction, that's my secular job. Only the pastors have spiritual jobs. No, if that's along your gifting and, and, and so forth, that's what God enabled you to do. You build houses for the Lord or whatever you construct. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, not, it's not less than, it's not secular. These things work in and out of the kingdom. But every person should look for an avenue to use what God has invested in them for his purposes. So he's glorified, so his help, the kingdom, is, is advanced. We want to seek them out. But this is interesting. When I, leave, when I read these verses, and I see these, uh, the, 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 these gifts here, um, prophecy, uh, ministry, teaching, exhortation, so forth. Um, I can show you in different parts of the word, and it seems to be like we're all supposed to do those. In other words, as I look through that list and I think, oh, well, let's see, like giving. Well, that's not my gift. I'm off the hook there. <laughs> or being merciful to people. Ah, that's not my gift. I'm kind of more of a judgment person. <laughs> <laughs> you, mercy, you mercy people, you go ahead and you have at it. Uh, I'm really good at just calling people out. <laughs> no. In fact, each of these gifts... You can find various passages that show every single one of us that we are to do those very things. Then what in the world is up with this with saying we're all different and we each have a unique deposit of God's grace in proportion to these giftings? Here's the way it works. I give, you give, you give, you give, you give. However there will be something on some people that causes them to excel and to do it more frequently with more proficiency and, 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 and greater uh, function than anybody else. There are some people that will operate in some of these gifts way above the average person who is just doing it as a, as a result of their integrity, their character, their generosity, and so forth. Everybody with me? And so as we look at all these gifts... All of us are going to be able to relate to them to a degree, and we should. And some of them, they go off. It it lights up. And and, and not limiting it to these particular gifts right now, it's kind of like uh, we get up at at some point and we announce, uh, you know, with Pastor Bill taking a missions trip, leading a team, or Pastor PJ leads teams, uh, and they say, hey, we're leading a team to this country. We're going to go at this time. And some of you, Sit out there and think, that's awesome, great. Good for you. I'm going to pray for you. There's nothing wrong with that. And other people hear the exact same message and they're like, oh, I totally should need to do this. I want to sign up. How do I get involved in that? How can I do that? And you think, well, certainly everyone, everyone who loves God wants to do that, don't they? Actually, they don't. And they're not bad people because of it. But it'll go off in certain individuals. There's something in you there. I know well, years ago, the Lord directed me in our church to train healing teams, all right? Meaning there would be two people or two or three, but two people at least that would minister healing to people at the end of our services. We've been doing that for several years. When I announced that, say, well, certainly everyone wants to be a part of a healing miracle. Awesome. Your power goes out of your hands into people. No? A lot of people thought, awesome. If I need prayer, I'll go to those people. But a certain number of people went, that's me. That's me. I need to be involved in that. I need to be a part of that. I'm going to the training. I'm going to be involved. I'm going to make my hands available as tools. Now, can all people pray for the sick? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's scriptural. But why does it go off in some people more than others? It's a God thing. What what stirs you? I'm getting way off track here a little bit. I'm going to come back next week (laughs) and get back on track. (laughs) Uh, But what stirs, what works in you? I I wish I could just give you a piece of paper and, you know, like a fortune cookie. Here's your gift. Here's your gift. Here's your gift. (laughs) Go ahead and open it up and see what's inside and see what you should do for God's kingdom and see how he's gifted you. But a lot of this discovery comes through, uh, comes through giving attention to it. Praying in the spirit, the gifts of God become real to you. You spend time with the Lord and you actually hear certain words at different times. And when you hear them, 
they jump at you. And no one around you even knows, because you might not <laughs> have a physical response, but inside it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's good. Oh yeah, 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 I like that, I like that. And you look around and think everyone feels the same way. And they don't. You, you're having an experience with God, and the person next to you is checking their texts. <laughs> and you look over and you think, seriously, like, this is like a life-changing moment right here? Well, it is for you. It's not for them. <laughs> or maybe it should be. I don't know. Maybe they didn't listen. Uh, but I'm just saying we're, we all react differently based on the grace that's in us. I didn't, I didn't put it there. I didn't choose it. It just is. And if I will diligently follow God's plan and seek his ways, I'm going to run into it. Remember, we taught you last week. Keep saying yes to the Lord. Whenever he speaks, whenever his word comes out, we say yes. That guarantees we'll be on the path we're supposed to be on. One of the first gifts listed here, I'll just introduce this and we'll come back later and, uh, and go further. One of the first gifts listed here, well, the first gift listed in Romans chapter 12 here is the gift of prophecy. Prophecy. Prophecy is an interesting one because it's listed in multiple gift categories and yet it seems to have a, have a different level or different degree of functionality depending on whether it's from the Father, whether it's from the Spirit, whether it's from uh, Jesus, meaning the, the office of a prophet. Here, this gift of prophecy is, is interesting because basically it means speaking for someone else. It is, another way to say it is, when a, when a prophecy comes, it is inspired utterance, okay? It's not synonymous with a prophet's ministry where, where someone would, sit, would tell the future or predict some great thing happening or have, or have visions and dreams and, and, you know, open visions and seeing angels and all that kind of stuff. No, th this gift is not synonymous with that, but it does mean a person speaks for someone else. And, and in this case, from God, God puts something in them. And I think in the world, this happens. I think this happens before people come to Jesus. But they don't know it is. They don't know it's from God. They, they just thought they're, at times, they just think they're really sharp. They're really smart. And they just see things clearer than everybody else. Uh, no, you don't. <laughs> There's a grace there. And sometimes God deposits uh, a word, a message, and they're able to speak it out. Of course, when you get saved, you start to recognize, oh, wow. I think God uses me when I do this. I start talking to people and like, ooh, good things come out. It's like I'm inspired to say it. It's like, and they're helped, they're encouraged, they're blessed. Yeah? And, and, and so this, this, this gift here, prophecy, uh, doesn't mean that someone who has it, everything that comes out of their mouth is from God. <laughs> if someone has a gift of prophecy, and, and if, if someone came to me and said, hey, you know, this is one of my gifts, Romans 12, the Father put it in me. Uh, so I have a word for you. <laughs> I'm getting nervous. <laughs> Here's what I mean by that. With the person who thinks everything they say, they can always just speak for God. No, I'm going to judge what you say. And if I say it to you, you should judge what I say. You understand what, I'm, what, what I mean by that? It doesn't mean everything a person says then is inspired because a whole lot of what we say is simply not inspired. You know, I've had people analyze me before, say, uh, you know, you went to lunch at, at, at a particular restaurant. And they think everything I do is spiritual. Why'd you go to lunch there? The hamburger sounded good. <laughs> Ooh, so the spirit showed you <sighs> burgers, burgers today was what he wanted. No, no, no. <laughs> it just sounded good. <laughs> hey man, does that make sense? Uh, <laughs> Could the Lord lead you in where to go to eat to, at a restaurant? For sure. Most of the time, is that the case? No. We don't over-spiritualize. And even in, 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 in gifts like these, I don't want to act like God is saying everything when he's not. You know, in, uh, in Exodus, we read about uh, Moses and Aaron. Remember Moses? Prophet Moses got the Ten Commandments. Uh, before the Ten Commandments episode... Uh, he was going in to speak to Pharaoh. Of course, he didn't want to. And, and he had Aaron there to go and speak on his behalf. And this is interesting language what God used. And it's Exodus chapter 7 and verse 1. It reads, So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. 
Interesting. In other words, Aaron was going in carrying the message from Moses. That's why Aaron was the prophet. Not a prophet of God, prophet of Moses. Yeah? So you can see how the word prophecy can be used, one person speaking for an, another individual. Now, when it comes to prophecy, how many know everyone can do this? Oh, maybe you don't know that. This is one of those, these examples. You said, all these gifts everyone can do, but some people can do them better, higher level, more frequency, greater effectiveness. I can show you scriptures. We will, we'll just end with this today. But... 1 Corinthians 14 says, you may all prophesy one by one. Yes. All. Yet, does everyone have that exact same gift? No. No, they don't. Um, uh, Ephesians 5.18 talks about worship. He said, be filled with the Spirit, speaking in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You realize back when these things were written, they didn't have screens to put the words up. They weren't all songs that everyone was reciting the song. No, they were all prophesying. They were all worshiping God by inspiration. The Holy Spirit was helping them to worship and praise God. Who can do this? Here's the answer. Everyone can do this. Everyone can prophesy on some level. But there are certain individuals, certain people who have a gift or grace from God in them. And if you'll, just, if you'll watch, you'll pay attention, you'll recognize you are speaking by inspiration more than the average Joe. You have an unction at times when no one else does. And it comes up out of you and you are speaking and using the gift of God in you. Amen. Does that mean you should go around giving everyone a word? I got a word for you, got a word for you, got a word for you. No, no, no. I mean, if the Lord gives you something, that could, could happen. But just be real normal. Be normal with the gift. You don't have to shake when you talk to people. <laughs> you know, you don't have to blow on them when you talk to them. Yeah. They don't have to fall when you give them the word. No, I'm okay with shaking. I'm okay with falling. I'm okay with any manifestation of the Spirit. I'm just saying most of the time these gifts will work in a very natural, normal, conversational way. And you talk and you're just encouraging people. You're just being a friend. You're just being loving and kind. And in the middle of that, people will recognize, man, that sure helped me. Man, that sure encouraged me. Man, that sure lifted me. And you'll say, you'll recognize, that's just not me because I'm so smart and I just know everything. There's a gift of God in me to help people. Amen. Amen. Let's stop there. Let's pick up again next time. Father, in the name of Jesus. Thanks for watching the Life Church YouTube channel. You can join us live right here on YouTube every Sunday morning at 930. If you enjoyed today's message, share it with a friend. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any Life Church videos. For more information about Life Church, check out lcboise.com. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.